seated. So my name is Jim Underwood, and I'm here to do a few introductions and thank some people that need to be thanked. Um, anyway, welcome to the uh, Dawson Sod Fall 2023 Moot Court Competition Finals. Obviously, this tournament is uh, funded by the law firm of Dawson and Sod, and I think it's so appropriate that even as we meet here today, we are in the shadows of the Mad Dog Dawson uh, statue out in the hallway. Uh, anyway, Bay Law School is very thankful to that law firm for the fact that they continue to fund this program and, uh, and that they're big believers not only in legal education, but the most important year of legal education, the first year of legal education, where I would say that the moot court competition is kind of the shining star in the first year curriculum, something I know students uh, love and hate, and, uh, but always <laughs> remember. Um, let me introduce our judges real quick and then thank a few people that deserve being thanked. Our Chief Justice today is Professor Bridget Fusilier, who uh, is a property teacher. She started the same day I think I started at the school, so she will be leading uh, the competition itself. Uh, Professor Jessica Asbridge over here, who is a, also a property teacher and uh, a LARC three teacher, as it turns out. Um, Professor Stephanie Tang is to the other side of Professor Fusilier, and she's our family law teacher, also teaches LARC three. I do. Um, just not this time. And uh, Professor Chris Yeager, who is a contract teacher and is opposed to me on this competition because this whole competition is contract law versus tort law. So we'll see who wins. Um, <laughs> and then we have two prior award winners over here to my far right, uh, King Ray Solins and Kelton Munch. And they were uh, like sitting like you guys last spring, very nervous, just dying for one hour to pass as quickly as possible. They have no memory of the event. <laughs> And yet they were the winners, so they get uh, <laughs> they get the joy of sitting in here today and and uh, and firing at you guys and making you guys as uncomfortable as possible. And by the way, congratulations to the four of you. Uh, you really ran the gauntlet and made it to the final round, and that is not an easy task. And uh, we are all winners. Um, uh, I want to thank some moot court officers because. Without these moot court officers, none of this event would be possible. And, uh, and, and they, they work a lot of hours and deal with stressed out students who uh, take out their stress on them. Uh, so if each of you would stand when I announce your name, uh, Danny Hayes, our president and uh, supreme leader of the moot court competition, <laughs> and Walker Montjoy, our vice president. Thank you, Walker. And uh, Lisa Marie Burkhart and Gabby LaShore, our barrister officers, thank you so much for all your work uh, in this event. And where is Ricky Lavecki? Is he in the room? Yes. yes, there you are, Ricky. Ricky, you understand things that are so complicated that none of us could ever hope to understand those things. So thank you for being here and doing your job so well so that others could listen into this event. Okay, I am done. And all we have left is four sets of arguments until we can have brownies, cookies, and lemon squares that are out in the hallway, and I cannot wait. So anyway, I'll turn things over to our Chief Justice, Professor Fusilier. Good, Good afternoon. I would like to call docket number 23EEFF, Max Batesmeyer, petitioner versus Val Fusewood, respondent. Is the petitioner ready? Respondent's ready. You may proceed. Good afternoon, Madam Chief Justice, your honors. May it please the court. My name is Rebecca Miller, and along with my co-counsel, Anna Jennings, we represent the petitioner, Max Batesmeyer. Today, we ask the court to reverse the judgment of the 16th Court of Appeals and remand for trial. There are two issues before the court today. I will address the first issue, whether the disclaimer of reliance clause in the contract between Batesmeyer and Fusewood bars Batesmeyer's fraudulent inducement claim. My co-counsel will address the second issue, whether the summary judgment evidence negates the reliance element of Batesmeyer's fraudulent inducement claim as a matter of law. 
Before I begin my argument, with the court's permission, I would like to reserve two minutes for rebuttal. Granted. Thank you. The court should reverse the judgment of the Court of Appeals and remand for trial because Batesmeyer was induced into signing a contract based on fraudulent representations from someone he saw as his most trusted, lifelong best friend. Thus, the Disclaimer of Reliance Clause should not bar Batesmeyer's claim for three reasons. First, I will discuss how the forest oil factors do not weigh in favor of enforcing the Disclaimer Clause. Second, I will demonstrate how the totality of the circumstances clearly show that Batesmeyer's claim should not be barred. Finally, I will urge the court to uphold the protection the law provides when one is induced into signing a contract through fraud. The forest oil factors do not weigh in favor of enforcement and the disclaimer should not bar Batesmeyer's claim. I encourage the court to recognize that these are factors, not elements. Yeah, while they are factors and not elements, um, there's not really much clarity as to how many of these do we need, is one way stronger than the other? So if we're trying to make some sort of ruling today that you know, impacts everybody going forward, how do we evaluate that and know how to assess these factors? Your Honor, you are correct. This court has, precedent shows that these factors have carried different weight in different cases. Therefore, I'm drawing your attention to this so that we recognize the fluidity as we discuss these factors. Not all of them need to be present. Therefore, even if one of them seems to be weighing in favor of enforcing the clause, that does not mean that we must. Therefore, we look at the factors in addition to the totality of the circumstances to ensure that we are not enforcing contracts that were created through fraud. The first factor can be examined in two parts. I, I still am not satisfied with that answer. Should we give more weight to one of the factors than the other? Or do they all, do they all have the exact same amount of weight in your opinion? Your Honor, precedent has not clarified this. Well, what do you think? Yes, we believe that all of the factors should be considered. However, they should be recognized as just that, factors. They do not all need to be met. They are something to guide our reasoning as we look at all of the factors. How many would you need? Your Honor, I believe that in the case before us, all of them weigh in favor of not enforcing. However, it is unclear throughout precedent which needs to be met to fulfill this uh, requirement based on the forest oil factors. So we examine them all. So then, hypothetically, let's say that all the factors are met here in favor of enforcement, except for one, say the fact that your client was not represented by counsel. Do you still think we ought to enforce it? Your Honor, yes. I think that's when we look to the totality of the circumstances. Do you think we should enforce it even though your client was not represented by counsel? Your Honor, I believe, I think that, uh, respectfully, I think that you're misconstruing the representation by counsel factor. The factor is examining whether or not they are represented, and in this case, we are arguing that he was not represented. I, I, uh, and if I agree with you, does that mean that I should not enforce the disclaimer? Yes, Your Honor. Okay. Additionally, the first factor, which requires that the terms of the contract were negotiated rather than boilerplate. So wait, I'm sorry, I think I'm confused. Is that a threshold issue then? Do we ask first, was the party represented by counsel? And if we say, no, they weren't, then we just throw the whole thing out at that point? No, Your Honor. The threshold issue is the clarity and specificity of the disclaimer. This court has held, I apologize. Uh, this court has recognized in Schlumberger that a release will not always negate a fraudulent inducement claim. Uh, however, this court carefully pointed out it, that its holding was based on the specific facts. Further, the court held in forest oil that when determining whether a disclaimer of reliance clause is enforceable or whether it should be avoided on grounds of fraudulent inducement, the court must not only examine the contract itself and the five factors, but the totality of the circumstances. So, counsel, could you, could you just give an example? Like, on the totality of the circumstances, what is the quintessential situation? If you just map out the quintessential situation where we should enforce a, uh, a disclaimer of reliance, what would that look like? Yes, Your Honor. A great example of a quintessential example of the totality of the circumstances enforcing the disclaimer is found in Schlumberger. In this, there was a clear and specific intent to disclaim reliance. In the case before us today, the facts do not show a clear and specific intent to disclaim reliance. Are you saying the language of the disclaimer is not good enough or something else is missing? Your Honor, I believe that we believe that both the language of the contract itself, which was not negotiated and which is boilerplate, leads us to not enforce the claim. And additionally, the totality of the circumstances 
lead us to not enforce the disclaimer. So what, what was the circumstance present in Schlumberger that's not present here that made things so clear? Your Honor, the language of the contract in Schlumberger got to the heart of the disagreement. It was discussing the negotiations of the party and the specific thing that was brought up later before this court. In the case today, the contract only d was discussed and negotiated around three, three terms, price, delivery, and insurance. Today, we're discussing the authenticity of the guitar. That is not going to the heart of the agreement. Therefore, this weighs in favor of not enforcing the disclaimer clause. Is it whether or not the, the terms were negotiated or boilerplate, just one of the forced oil factors rather than the quintessential circumstance? Yes, Your Honor, it is one of the factors, but we believe that it clearly shows that the disclaimer should not bar and should not bar Bates Meyer's claim and should not be enforced. So that factor should be given more weight or is just positive? No, Your Honor, as previously stated, the factors should all be considered in addition to the totality of the circumstances to make sure that we are not enforcing claims that are brought based on contracts induced through fraud. And counsel, how do we know that we've crossed the finish line? How, at what point do we know that, that we are either in favor of you or not in favor of you? What, what is the defining moment or defining fact that gets us all the way there? Your Honor, I believe that in order to have clarity in this area, we need to examine the, all of the factors and the totality of the circumstances. I believe this because we, this court has uh, refused to enforce a per se rule where if there is a disclaimer clause in a contract that it is just enforceable. Therefore, it is important to examine all of these factors in light of uh, the totality of the circumstances which require a clear and specific intent to disclaim reliance. And going back to the earlier question about if one factor is missing, what if two factors are missing? Your Honor, the, I, we believe that that can still bar, or that can still weigh in favor of our client to not bar the claim based on the totality of the circumstances. In the case before us, Batesmeyer was a music fanatic, but he was a mere hobbyist. Uh, he relied on his trusted friend who helped him throughout the entire transaction. Fusewood was coincidentally in desperate need of cash at the time that he misrepresented the guitar to one of his best friends and which can be seen on page seven of the record. And Fusewood knew that he was more knowledgeable in this business than Batesmeyer. He was in a situation in which he needed money and he was aware that Batesmeyer was eager to get his foot in the door of vintage guitar sales. This is seen on pages five and seven of the and record. Hadn't he indeed already gotten his foot in the door and was already conducting transactions with your client? Your Honor, he had only been in two transactions previously. Both of them had been under the representations of Fusewood. Therefore, this further demonstrates that he was relying on these claims from someone that he trusted and saw as his lifelong friend. Fusewood is someone who served in his wedding, someone he grew up with, someone he was in a band with as a kid. He trusted him, and therefore, it is unreasonable to argue that he had a clear and specific intent to disclaim reliance because he made these agreements because of his reliance on his best friend. So when you talk friend. about this relationship of trust, you're not arguing that this was a fiduciary relationship just based upon their personal friendship, are you? No, Your Honor. Kathy versus Meyer says that's an uphill road for you. Uh, yes, Your Honor. In that case, they, they I mean, had, In that case, they had lunch together every day, didn't they? Correct, but they had only been friends for a few years, under five years, and in this case, we're looking at 55 years plus of friendship. We are not arguing that this is a fiduciary relationship, but we are arguing that this is closer than arm's length. <clears throat> Given that relationship, counsel, is there any anything the parties could have written into their agreement that you think would be um, an enforceable disclaimer of reliance, or does the relationship actually kind of act like the, the, the touchstone factor in this? Your Honor, I think that precedent has shown us that if they had negotiated the terms of the contract and had a contract that was not boilerplate, then that would mo weigh more in favor of enforcing the clause. However, here they only discussed price, insurance, and delivery. They did not have hotly contested negotiations, which is required at, by this court for this factor, and they did not, and the contract only included terms such as buyer and seller. It didn't even include their names. Counsel, you, you used the term boilerplate a couple couple times. What what do you mean by boilerplate? Yes, Your Honor. Boilerplate language is something with ready-made language, something copied and pasted and found in multiple different contracts, which it was used in all of the contracts that Bates Meyer signed. So are you, are you saying that a person who's in business has to write a completely new contract from scratch every single time? You can't, you can't have the efficiency of having this is the standard sales agreement I use and then we fill in specific terms? Your Honor, that is not what we are requiring. 
we are requiring that the terms of the contract are negotiated. There can be common elements. However, the thing that is bringing the bringing this case before the court today needs to have been negotiated and cannot just be part of a boilerplate contract. So you're saying for a valid disclaimer, that cannot be already written into the contract? I'd have to specifically write that out every single time if I'm going to have a valid agreement? Not necessarily, Your Honor. However, in order to satisfy the factor of making sure that this is not boilerplate and that it does include negotiated terms, it would weigh more in favor of the opposing client if there were things such as their names instead of buyer and seller, and if it was not the exact same disclaimer that had been seen in previous contracts. But, but if it's only two people, the buyer and the seller, I mean, don't we know in reading the document who each of us are in this relationship, and isn't there some obligation on the part of your client to read and understand what he's signing and maybe ask questions? If it bothered him, he could have said, hey, friend, um, what's this sentence in here? I, I don't get what this is about. That is correct, Your Honor. However, this court held in trans court that in order to satisfy the first factor, the parties need to have a series of extensive, complex, and hotly contested negotiations. No such series of negotiations occurred here. But counsel, in trans court, wasn't there no evidence of bribery in the underlying uh, contract as well? So how do you reconcile the holding in that case with the circumstances here? Uh, yes, Your Honor. They, they did enforce the disclaimer in trans court. However, the parties fully and finally resolved that any claims regarding to the exact question that brought them before the court in their settlement agreement. That additionally, that brings up the settlement agreement context where this has been, these factors have been prim primarily uh, used in order to examine settlement agreements, which is not what we're looking at today. So how significant is that? If this is not a settlement context, should we just refuse to enforce it? Is that your argument? Not necessarily, Your Honor. I think that the more important things to examine are the totality of the circumstances, which require a clear and specific intent to disclaim reliance. Isn't the settlement context an important circumstance, or the lack thereof here? Yes, Your Honor, but I believe that the more important considerations for the factors that are seen in the record today should go away from the settlement agreement argument and look- But this court said in a footnote in Italian Cowboy that the settlement context is an additional consideration uh, that, that argues in favor of enforcement when it exists, and in this case, this could be an argument that helps you, that you seem to be shying away from it. Yes, Your Honor, I think that it does assist us in our argument today. However, I think that the facts on the record today clearly demonstrate that this is an enforcement, this is a disclaimer that should not be enforced and his claim should not be barred based on the facts in the record. These are best friends, people who had done life together. They. Batesmeyer was relying on Fusewood in a closer than arm's length relationship based on multiple misrepresentations. So what, Your could, Honor, what could Fusewood have done to protect themselves under this circumstance? If I know I'm going to engage in a transaction with a friend, um, but I don't want potential liability for this transaction, how, how do I do, I mean, we, we've got to get give some guidance here. That's why this came all the way up here to the Texas Supreme Court. So what do we do? How do we provide some degree of clarity here to say moving forward, sellers, this is what you should follow? Yes, Your Honor. I see that I'm out of time. May I answer and then briefly conclude? Thank you. Moving forward, for individuals entering into contracts such as this, we believe that the framework of the five forest oil factors and the totality of the circumstances provide clear thresholds for individuals writing contracts. In order to satisfy the factors and the totality of the circumstances, that should be the threshold. As such, we ask the court to reverse the summary judgment and remand the case for trial. Freedom to contract cannot and should not prevail in circumstances brimming with fraudulent and deceptive behavior. Reverse and remand. Thank you. Madam Chief Justice, your honors, may it please the court. As my co-counsel stated, my name is Anna Jennings, and I also represent petitioner Max Batesmeyer. 
Today, I will be addressing the second issue on appeal, which is whether the summary judgment evidence conclusively negates the required reliance element of Batesmeyer's fraudulent inducement claim as a matter of law. The case today is about the unfortunate ending of a 55-year lifelong friendship, a guitar sale gone wrong, and a man's constitutional right to a jury trial. Today, we assert that the 555th District Court of Rickon County erred in granting summary judgment in favor of Val Fusewood, and we assert and we ask this court to reverse and remand for trial for two main reasons. First, justifiable reliance is a fact issue for a jury. And second, the alleged red flags are insufficient to conclusively negate justifiable reliance. Following the summary judgment standard we have here today, we must remember that in light and in viewing the evidence and the facts on the record, we must view them in light most favorable to the non-movement. In this case, is our client, Mr. Bates Meyer. We must also indulge every reasonable inference in light most favorable to Bates Meyer. And finally, we must resolve any doubt, even the slightest doubt, in light most favorable to Bates Meyer. And that leads us to the facts of this case. Yes, Your Honor, that, that is correct. Ordinarily, justifiable reliance is a fact issue for a jury. However, the Texas Supreme Court has held in very narrow cases an exception where it can be viewed as a matter of law. We see this in not only the Barrow Shaver case, we see this in the J.P. Morgan, Morgan and Orca Assets case, as well as the, uh, the Grant Thornton case. And so we see this narrow exception, and in order to see how they implement this narrow exception in deciding whether or not the issue of justifiable reliance can be negated as a matter of law, we have to see what is justifiable reliance, how do we measure it, and how do we use it. And we see this as established in Thornton, where we use a plaintiff that is claiming fraud we look to see their characteristics as well as their appreciation of the facts and the circumstances before or at the time of the alleged fraud, which in this case would be at the time of the signing of the contract. But counsel, so, isn't this case very different from Thornton or Orca Assets where it, or even Lewis or Bank of America where the courts have found that there is significant kind of business background that was directly related to the facts at issue here? Was it Bat Bates Meyer just the hobbyists and how is how are you reconciling the facts here between those cases and the cases at hand absolutely your honor so i'm reconciling it as the distinguishment distinguishment between this case as well as the three cases that i mentioned and so we're using this measurability where we look at the plaintiff who's claiming fraud in this case would be bates meyer we look to the characteristics as well as the appreciation of the facts and circumstances as this court did in the cases that i previously mentioned and so in order to distinguish we see how they're how they're conclusively negating justifiable reliance whereas in the borrow schaefer case they're using one route which is direct contradiction found on page 24 of this case in the record that is not an issue today before an appeal however in the grant thornton as well as the jp morgan orca assets case they're using red flags as the red flag impediment in order to conclusively negate the issue of justifiable reliance now the distinguishment between those two cases is that in this case we have bates meyer who yes Absolutely, you are correct, honor, Your Honor, in saying that he was a mere hobbyist. However, in the Grant Thornton case, we see that this was uh, investors who were buying bonds from a corporation. However, the distinguishment between that case is the fact that the, in, the senior portfolio folio manager in the Grant Thornton case, the central, the central reasoning behind the holding of ruling that case as a matter of law was the fact that the senior portfolio manager had learned of very specific knowledge that the corporation they were buying bonds from absolutely like it was an undisputed fact that he knew that the corporation they were buying bonds from lost its primary source of funding and he even ad he admitted to that and so as a matter of law they they ruled that justifiable reliance was uh, was going to be as a matter of law and there's no way he could have uh, justifiably relied on the opposing party because he admitted to knowing that very specific red flag information hey they lost the source of funding and therefore he admitted that by buying those bonds Counsel, in this case if I remember some of the red flags, it seems like each of them is something your client was aware of. For example, that the appraisal was not being done or certification was not being received as had been done in the past. That was a red flag and your client knew it. So how, why wouldn't summary judgment be appropriate here? 
Absolutely, Your Honor. And so on page 25 of the record, you'll see the four red flags in this case that are stated. The first being that there was no proof uh, or evidence that there had been um, proof of the missing or stolen guitar. While that may be true, also on page four of the record, there was also no proof that it wasn't stolen or that it, it wasn't it, missing. It's been missing, allegedly, according to the story, for years. It shows up in Memphis in some little guitar shop. His friend is selling it to him for way, way below what the value would potentially be if it was genuine. I mean, it seems like there's a giant red flag when you put all of that together, kind of like the totality of the circumstances your co-counsel was talking about. Kind of, to me, the totality of the flags seem to be a really, really big flag. I mean, at what point are we not going to say, if it's too good to be true, it probably is, and we don't have any relief here? Yes, Your Honor. Respectfully, I would disagree that the red flags present are sufficient to conclusively negate justifiable reliance, because when we're speaking of conclusively negating the issue of justifiable reliance, that means that reasonable minds could not differ. And the four red flags, which two you did mention, of the story of its reappearance, as well as uh, Fusewood selling for a fraction of the price, both of these red flags, while one mind could think one way, another mind could think can think a completely different way, okay, but more specifically. But, but aren't we also supposed to take into account uh, the appellant's uh, educational background and experience? Uh, and so I, th I think when you look at this, and here is a guitar hobbyist with decades of business law experience, shouldn't that be a factor that we consider? Yes, Your Honor. And that, that points to the J.P. Morgan Orca Assets case, where when I was answering Justice Tang's a question in regards to red flags and the reasoning and what the court focused on that was central to those holdings. In the J.P. Morgan Orca Assets case, uh, it wasn't the general experience that they were going off in order to rule the case as a matter of law. What the holding in that case and the court in that case really focused on was not that they had experience in, in the oil and gas industry, not that they had general knowledge of the oil and gas industry, but the court was very specific in ruling that the party that was representing Orca Assets, though it was a newfound company, that the people that were representing Orca Assets and signing those deals had extensive and decades worth of experience in negotiating in acquiring oil and gas contracts. And so it wasn't the general knowledge of the oil of the oil and gas industry. And so that would be the argument towards our red flags that reasonable minds could differ as to whether the experience or background as to whether or not he was uh, equipped to be able to notice, notice such differences. Because this isn't just a general guitar, right? We're not talking about general knowledge of a guitar. This isn't a guitar you could walk down the street and uh, purchase at the local music store. This is a very specific 1960s made guitar with a custom color, with a very specific serial number, and all of these specificities that would require one of actually Fusewood's knowledge of decades of experience, because Fusewood in this case is the one that decided to pursue his dream post high school in order to get his associate's degree in music and also study from what he once called a hobby of selling vintage instruments which then turned into his entire business that he owned. And he had decades of experience. He was known for being specialized in relocating, locating, buying, refurbishing, and selling these vintage instruments. And so arguably, here in this case, Fusewood is the one with this knowledge that prior to even making, making the deal in Memphis to buying this, you would think that he would have done his due diligence and being the one that has decades of experience of purchasing such in instruments here, but which Fusewood failed to do. But, but even if Fusewood knew, and even if Fusewood had done due diligence, isn't it on Batesmeyer? Just because Batesmeyer trusted Fusewood, it seems like we're letting him off the hook a little bit here for not doing his due diligence. Yes, Your Honor. And on the topic of due diligence, we see in the N. Ray Mercer case, and you can find this on page 34 of the record, that the Court of Appeals there ended up not allowing the case to go to the Texas Supreme Court and remanded it for trial on the issue of justifiable reliance because they ruled that UCS in that case couldn't rely on Mercer's representations, stating that if the recipient has reason to believe that the promise will be carried out, then he had no duty to do his due diligence in that matter. And so fo following that, we see that in this case where, yes, we have the background as stated on 
page four and five of the record of not only their background in their relationship, but also their previous business transactions, as my co-counsel mentioned, because in those transactions, it wasn't uh, Batesmeyer going out on his own doing those transactions. He had specifically reached out to Fusewood asking for mentorship and guidance, not just in finding the guitar, the guitars that he eventually sold, but Fusewood guided and mentored him in the process of those two business transactions. This wasn't a mentoring process. This was a business deal. I mean, when you're paying $350,000 for something, I don't think that's a mentorship opportunity. Um, and you've got a sophisticated party. So again, it seems like we're giving him a free pass for his stupidity, frankly. Yes, Your Honor, and that is when we look at the two cases that I had previously mentioned as to how this court has implemented the measurability of justifiable reliance. Going back to the, the measurability of the justifiable reliance, we look to the characteristics and as and we also look to the appreciation of the circumstances. And what's important here is yes, what he knew before and at the time of the alleged fraud, but arguably what's different here is what he didn't know before or at the time of the alleged fraud. And I will point the panel to page 11 of the record, as we have stated, and after the transaction, when Mr. Batesmeyer figured out that the guitar was not authentic, when he tried to auction it off, he ended up doing his own investigation, and he came into contact with a man named Mr. Mustard. Now, Mr. Mustard was an employee at Strawberry Lane, where Dr. Robert and Fusewood had their appraisal. Now, what was uh, conveyed to Batesmeyer from Mr. Mustard that when Fusewood brought the guitar into Strawberry Lane to Dr. Robert, not only did Fusewood admit to knowing the guitar was not authentic, but he asked, and on page 11 of the record, and I quote, if Dr. Robert could fudge this one just a little. Not only that, but he said Fus Fusewood promised him that he would provide him more business. He also stated that he would pay him $10,000 of whatever money Batesmeyer was going to give him for the guitar. And so we have differing opinions here. We have different situations. We have different conversations where we assert that reasonable minds can differ. And so while we're not arguing the, uh, we're not arguing whether or not something could be labeled a red flag, but we're simply stating that reasonable minds could differ given the facts and the evidence and viewing them in light most favorable to Batesmeyer, we're stating that reasonable minds could differ as to what's going on in this situation and what's going on behind the scenes of these conversations. But counsel, and couldn't your client have just done this investigation? All of the conversations that you just said, it seems like your client could have just done all of this prior to purchasing the Qatar. I mean, $350,000 is not chump change here. We have a lot of money on the line. He's a lawyer for decades. Shouldn't he have just done some of this investigation prior to purchasing this guitar? Yes, absolutely, Your Honor, he could have. Uh, but the, the question after that is, was he required to? And as I had previously mentioned, the Mercer case where the standard of justifiable reliance and, and there is presence of any form of red flags, it imposes no duty to investigate. And further, in the Moss Littleton case, where this is actually very similar, it was a 30-year attorney, and the court in that case said that reliance was justified, even though the attorney was a victim of fraud, and stating that his professional status as a lawyer, especially when he wasn't representing himself, did not bar him from his claim. So counsel, and when you fast forward 30 years to when you're retiring from the practice of law, are you saying that in that case, if you're about to spend $350,000 on a guitar, you're not going to do your own investigation and the Supreme Court should just let you off the hook in that case? No, Your Honor, that is not what we're stating. What we're stating here is the difference between whether he should have um, or whether he was required to. And the question of is if whether he was required to or whether it was reasonable, it sounds like that is a fact issue for a jury to decide and not a requirement that one can rule as a matter of law because when we're balancing these things, we're also balancing his constitutional right to a trial by jury. And that is something that this court especially has not has not taken lightly. And also, also it, it seems to me the law is pretty clear that in the absence of red flags, you're allowed to rely upon other people, you're allowed to trust them to tell you the truth. But there are red flags here. Did your client do any investigation on his own in response to those red flags? No, Your Honor, and on the record on page 25, these are the red flags they are, that are alleged by the uh, opposing party, and we're stating uh, not as, we're not stating in absolutes as to whether the red flags are red flags or are they not red flags. We're stating that when looking at all of the evidence and we're viewing it in light most favorable to Bate Batesmeyer based off of the conversations that have happened, we're stating that reasonable minds could in fact differ. And also I see, Your Honor, that I'm out of time. May I briefly conclude? Your honors, although contested, there is not conclusive evidence to the rule in this to rule this case as a matter of law. 
and rob Mr. Batesmeyer of not only his constitutional right to a trial by jury, but also his Texas constitutional right to a trial by jury. Batesmeyer is worthy of his day in court, and for the reasons previously stated, we ask this court to reverse and remand for trial. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chief Justice, Associate Justices, may it please the court. My name is Nicholas Baker, along with my co-counsel, Jake Adams, we represent the respondent. I will be addressing the first issue on the appeal, which is whether the disclaimer of reliance clause should be enforced. My co-counsel will be addressing the second, which is whether Mr. Batesmeyer could have justifiably relied on Mr. Fusewood's representations as a matter of law. Your Honors, we just heard the petitioner spend the past 30 minutes arguing the merits of their case for their client. However, it is notable that that same client, a highly experienced attorney in the world of business law, spent less than half that time reading a two-page contract to purchase a $350,000 property. This court should affirm the judgments of the lower court for three main reasons. First, all the forest oil factors favor enforcement of the disclaimer. Second, the totality of the surrounding circumstances show that Mr. Batesmeyer truly intended disclaim reliance on Mr. Fusewood's representations. And third, a judgment affirming the judgment of the lower courts would be consistent with Texas's public policy uh, favoring freedom of contract. How can you say that all the factors clearly favor your client when there are so many that just seem to me to stick out as blatantly against? I mean, to, to call, uh, to say that this contract wasn't boilerplate would be to say that a Mad Libs is an original short story. Um, and then the p parties were clearly not at arm's length giving their extensive um, history together. Uh, and so there's, there's two right there. Uh, and then the third could be that Bates, uh, Batesmeyer was a novice to the vintage guitar market. I mean, here's three out of five of the factors that clearly go against. So how can you say that they all are in favor. Your Honor, because uh, a judgment uh, incons uh, consistent with this court's precedent mandates uh, mandates that the court find that these factors favor enforcement. And as to the negotiated factor, which was uh, your first question, which is the first part of the first factor, this is whether the contract's terms were negotiated. And here, as stated on uh, in the record, that the parties negotiated over a course of several days over the course of a week. In fact, Mr. Batesmeyer specifically was able to negotiate certain terms out of the contract and in his favor. And so it is, it is not just classic boilerplate. And moreover, as to the arm's length transaction that you brought up, this is uh, an arm's length transaction is, does not just consider the relation between the parties. There are three distinct elements to an arm's length transaction. An arm's length transaction is between parties with generally equal bargaining power, each acting in its own interest, and uh, between two unrelated parties. And here, these parties had generally equal bargaining power. Just as I just me mentioned, Mr. Batesmeyer was able to negotiate terms in his favor. Also, as to whether they were each acting in their own interest, Mr. Uh, Fusewood was uh, wanting to make a profit from the sale, and then Mr. Batesmeyer was filled with, as stated in the record, emotion and greed at the prospect of purchasing this instrument, as stated on page eight of the record. And, uh, and he wanted to sell this to make a profit because he knew, as stated on page nine, of its investment potential and value to possible collectors. And as for the sophistication of the parties, this court has, while, uh, while he it, it admittedly does not have 30 years of experience. This uh, court has specified that this factor only requires, quote, knowledge in business matters. And here, Mr. Batesmeyer is an attorney that has practiced complex business litigation for over two decades. And but, he has but it had been some time since he had been actually practicing in the business area. I mean, he was doing some appellate work towards the end. He's retired. Um, so maybe what he did earlier in his career maybe isn't you know really on the forefront of his mind anymore. Um, so, is he really truly as sophisticated as you're painting him to be? Absolutely, Your Honor. And we will note that it does stay in the record that he retired in July 2020 on page five of the record. He retired in July 20, or transaction, sorry, occurred in July 2020, and he retired in 2020. So, at the most, he was only retired for a few months. So, after you take two decades of experience and in the complex business litigation into account, we believe that that should be sufficient to last a few months. And also, he drafted sales contracts, which is the exact same contract at concern here, and he advised clients as to their legal consequences. 
Plus, we believe he is sophisticated enough to understand and uh, engage in a transaction of this caliber. I think one of the character traits of, of an arm's length transaction, you said, is it's between unrelated parties. Clearly, that doesn't apply here, does it? Your Honor, we assert uh, that that an unrelated party, as this court has uh, addressed it as in arm, arm's length, this court has not found that arm's length is not satisfied outside of a fiduciary relationship. But here- Wait, so you're saying there's a dichotomy. It's either arm's length or fiduciary relationship. Nothing no, in between. No, Your Honor, that's not what we assert. We are just, uh, we assert that this court has not found an arm's length transaction outside, uh, a non-arm's length transaction outside of a fiduciary relationship. And these parties are not related by a fiduciary relationship nor by blood is what we are asserting. So, so that's all that counts. 55 no. years friendship doesn't count. You still call it arm's length. No, Your Honor. You would, you would expect these parties to deal with each other the same as two strangers. Absolutely not, Your Honor. And what we are saying is that when you have three elements of an arm's length transaction and arguably two that actually are more relevant to this transaction uh, as to whether they were each acting in their own interests and as to whether they had generally equal bargaining power, that concerns whether how they were engaging in this transaction. The fact that they had a friendship is just a passive trait between these two parties. And so this, uh, what concerns this transaction is the two elements that are also here. And so if this court does decide that arm's length does not favor, it should uh, favor enforcement, it should find that uh, consistent with this precedent in Transcord, that it does not weigh heavily enough to overcome the other factors. And that so is- So how many, uh, kind of along the lines of what we were asking um, opposing counsel, we've got five here. Is there any bright line to draw? Is there any that's weighted heavier than another when we're looking at these factors? Uh, no, Your Honor. And we believe that has been done deliberately by this court. This court has done so because depending on the specific uh, transaction that the court is addressing and the specific disclaimer of reliance situation that they're addressing, there are going to be different facts that will weigh more heavily in that case than maybe in a different case. And so that is actually the adaptability of those factors that has made this test so effective and, uh, and has applied for so many years. Since Schlumberger back in 1997. And so uh, the second part of the sec first factor is actually whether the party specifically discussed the issue which has become the topic of the subsequent dispute. And in fact, this court recently addressed this factor specifically in the Transcourt case, noting that this factor concerns whether the parties considered the consequences of the reliance disclaimer in light of the material issues of the dispute. Here, the material issue, the entire point of this controversy is the re representations that Mr. Fuse have made to Mr. Batesmeyer about the guitar belonging to John Lennon. In fact, the entire reason the suit was brought because is because it did not in fact belong to John Lennon. And so while Mr. Batesmeyer heard these representations and as I just laid out, considered them to be material, he entered into a contract expressly disclaiming reliance on these representations. And that is what this factor concerns. And thus this court should find that this factor favors enforcement. Was there anything in the contract that actually talks about this representations regarding John Lennon's guitar? Wasn't the only terms of the contract dealing with, as opposing counsel said, the price uh, and the terms regarding the guitar itself? There's no nothing in there regarding the prior ownership or chain of custody. It was there. Uh, no, Your Honor. Not uh, no, Your Honor. And uh, what this factor concerns is not the term in the contract. It says it's concerning whether the parties specifically discussed the issue, which has become the topic of the subsequent dispute. So it's actually not concerning whether that representation was in the contract, it's concerning whether or not they discussed it prior to Mr. Batesmeyer expressly disclaiming reliance by entering into the contract. But I wonder, counsel, to what extent could they really have gotten that far into the conversation given the fact that we know that uh, while Batesmeyer did have experience as an attorney, he wasn't very experienced in the area of musical instruments any more than a hobby. So that must have been a fairly surface level conversation that went on. It couldn't have been in very sufficient detail, it would seem. As to the history of the guitar? Yes. So what this factor requires is whether or not he heard material representations made and whether he chose to disclaim reliance on those representations. And here, the entire point of the controversy here is that the guitar did not end up belonging to John Lennon. And so the guitar uh, just did not have that quality. And Counsel, maybe I'm, maybe I'm missing something here, but it sounds like you're saying all that matters that the person made some misrepresentations about a fact, and those were heard by the person who signs off on the disclaimer, and then element one here is satisfied. I'm, I'm not quite tracking what what is the scope of, of, of negotiation that we care about here. Is it really just they make a misrepresentation? Is that it, it's not reflected in the document anywhere? It's not it's not discussed or, or kicked back and forth between the, the parties for any period of time? 
Your Honor, this was extensively discussed by the parties, and in fact, uh, as as the the record states on uh, pages eight and nine. The parties here specifically discussed uh, the representations as to whether the guitar belonged to John Lennon. And the important point regarding this is because at the end of the day, we are talking about disclaimer of reliance. Are you trying to put a quote on any representation? I mean, for there to be a misrepresentation, you have to talk about it. Well, in the misrepresentation context, yes, but, uh, but which is what's a concern here. What this factor concerns is whether there was a representation made to the other side and whether the parties <laughs> entered into the contract disclaiming reliance on that representation, whether he knew. If, if, if there was a, a dispute that was brought after the if, uh, over a representation that was made after the contractual phase where he, after he had disclaimed reliance, then this wouldn't apply. Because well, this is a signed agreement, right? Where he could have complete contract would have been signed. Well, because he wouldn't have had the opportunity to discuss the issue of the dispute prior to disclaiming reliance, the material issue of the dispute. I, I think we're losing sight of you know, the origin of this area of the law. In Schlumberger, what we had was two parties in the middle of, of a dispute with differing opinions about the value of a diamond mine, and they decided to put that dispute behind them and enter into a contract. It was a settlement of a dispute. And Forrest Oil, you had a lawsuit between the plaintiff and the defendant and they, with a known dispute, and they decided to put that dispute behind them and enter into a settlement agreement. In this case, there was no known dispute being settled. And so a disclaimer of reliance makes no sense here for this court to enforce. How do you deal with the fact that we don't have a settlement con uh, context here? Absolutely, Your Honor. Well, this court has actually applied disclaimer of reliances outside the settlement agreement. When, when the argument was not made about the settlement context, but when the argument has been made, this court has stuck to enforcement in the context of settlement agreements. And one time that, uh, it, you know, the, the third trilogy of the cases, the Italian cowboy, was not a settlement context, and this court pointed out in a footnote that, that would have been an important consideration in refusing to enforce it. Yes, Your Honor. This court has noted that the presence of a settlement agreement can serve as an additional factor favoring enforcement. However, that does not end the inquiry for that. That was the footnote in Italian cowboy. That was dicta. But in Schlumberger and Forest Oil, the court went on for multiple paragraphs to talk about the importance of the settlement context. This court has deemed important, when, when a disclaimer of reliance is in a settlement agreement, they found it to be an additional factor because disclaimers of reliance, like settlement agreements, can serve as a way to end a claim. However, that has not stopped this court from applying these, uh, th these disclaimers of reliance outside the settlement agreement context. So if we put aside the settlement context, what is the important policy of the state of Texas? Because we don't like people committing fraud, and you would argue that we like freedom of contract. But when there's fraud, you really don't have freedom of contact, of contract. So if we push, put aside the lack of a settlement context, which is highly favored for finality in the state of Texas, what's the public policy for ever enforcing one of these disclaimers? Well, Your Honor, as you stated, public policy favoring freedom of contract for, uh, supports favor, uh, enforcing these disclaimers. But not in the face of fraud. Fraud vitiates everything it touches, right? Hundred years of case law that says that. Your Honor, that has not stopped this court in the past from Schlumberger applying these disclaimers in the, in the face of fraud. Context. And Transcourt, when uh, that has, when there was an eight hundred million dollar agreement, the parties still and uh, applied the disclaimer of alliance and no clause and enforced it. No argument in that case about the lack of a settlement context. Your Honor, this court has seen this as an exception to fraud, and it, it is wise to do so. When if this court was to make a per se rule that in all cases of fraud that these disclaimers of alliances should not be enforceable. This court and all Texas courts would be inundated with several cases alleging fraud. But, but and there would that be a leave some pretty darn good public policy that if somebody engages in fraud to get somebody to sign an agreement that we shouldn't like be excited and supportive of that? Um, that sounds like some good public policy. Your Honor, we do not dispute the public policy against fraud. However, what we do uh, dispute is that in every uh, case in which there is an allegation of fraud that these agreements should not be enforced. That in this case, there is summary judgment evidence that fraud occurred, right? Yes. Okay. And in the cases of uh, in cases where there have been allegations of fraud, this court has enforced these disclaimers because uh, at the end at the end of the day, they want to this this court wants to preserve judicial resources of the courts of Texas, and we don't want to have uh, several plaintiffs alleging fraud just to get past the summary judgment phase to get to trial. And so this court has deem deemed fit in cases such as Transcourt to solve these issues on summary judgment. And. As to the totality of surrounding circumstances, Your Honors, this relates to whether the parties truly intended to disclaim reliance on each other's representation. 
not to the fairness or unfairness of the agreement. And here, we have Mr. Batesmeyer, who is a practicing attorney who has engaged in these transactions not once, not twice, but three times with this exact disclaimer of reliance in it. And also, uh, Mr. Uh, as with this court's precedent, this court has found when parties uh, contractually promised not to rely on extra contractual statements and promised that they, more than that, did not in fact rely on such representations that they should uh, find that the totality of surrounding circumstances show that they truly intended to disclaim fraud. And here we have the exact same situation in section 2.1 of the agreement. And your honors, I will briefly conclude. This court should affirm the judgment of the lower courts and stand by its longstanding precedent and public policy favoring freedom of contract. Thank you. Good afternoon, Madam Chief Justice, and may it please the court. My name is Jake Adams, and I represent the respondent, Mr. Val Fuster. Your honors, a lawyer should be competent, prompt, and diligent, both in the lawyer's professional service to clients and in the lawyer's own business and personal affairs. These are the words set forth in the preamble of the Texas Disciplinary Rules of Professional Conduct. As my colleague, Mr. Baker, just elaborated, the petitioner's failure in this case to read and understand the terms of the contract, which he signed on three separate occasions, falls short of any standard of diligence we hold members of this profession to model. But more importantly, your honors, today, that conduct also falls short of what the law requires. Three considerations mandate affirmance today. First, the presence of a direct contradiction between contractual language and a preceding oral representation, what this court has called a very large red flag. Second, this court should recognize and reaffirm its precedence, suggesting that the presence of other red flags on the record in this case negate justifiable reliance as a matter of law. Third, and finally, sound principles of public policy, which this court has articulated, counsel in favor of enforcing the party's written agreement over three contractual oral representations. As recently as 2019, this court has reaffirmed its long established rule that reliance on an oral representation that is directly contradicted by the express terms of a written agreement between the parties is not justified as a matter of law. Where's the direct contradiction here? Yes, Your Honor. So section 2.4 of the agreement stated uh, Mr. Batesmeyer agreed that the buyer was relying on his own investigation into the facts relating to the instrument, that he was not relying on any statements by Mr. Fusewood into the facts relating to the instrument. So you're not saying that there are any facts referenced in the contract that were at odds with, with representation regarding the authenticity of the guitar? The For example, in the, in the Mercedes-Benz case, where this court found a red flag in the terms of the contract, the plaintiff argued that he had the right to relocate his dealership, but the contract said otherwise. It wasn't some generic disclaimer clause that was the red flag. It was the facts referenced in the contract. And if your argument was, was correct, uh, every disclaimer of reliance clause would automatically render summary judgment for the defendant. Uh, that's not the case, Your Honor, and I'd like to offer two responses to that. First, in Orca Assets, uh, a case decided which the case you referenced, Mercedes-Benz, relied on, uh, there this court rejected an argument from uh, an appellate court that the direct contradiction standard must explicitly speak to the same uh, subject matter and have this kind of exact, uh, exaction in language. Uh, and here, uh, even if that were the standard, uh, it is met because you have an oral representation relating to an investigation into the guitar that confirmed its authenticity, whereas the plain language of the contract likewise references uh, a disclaimer of reliance on an investigation into the guitar's origins. Um, but importantly, um, in Orca Assets, this court stated that this is a red flag when the language of the contract 
conflicts with an earlier representation such that a reasonable person could not read it and still be said to justifiably rely on the prior representation. And we agree with the petitioners that the inquiry into whether this red flag is present does occur at the time that the fraud uh, allegedly occurred. The basis for the fraud claim is not uh, uh, whether or not there was a reliance. The, the premise of the fraud claim is that your client said this was John Lennon's guitar. When you look at the contract, there's nothing that says otherwise. If there was, you're right, that'd be a giant red flag that would entitle you to summary judgment. But there's nothing in the contract that, that raises a red flag that this is not John Lennon's guitar. We disagree with that, Your Honor. We, we think that Section 2.1 of the agreement, uh, which the petitioners have stipulated, is unambiguous. And again, which the record shows that this individual was able to, on three separate occasions, review through the lens of his highly uh, high training as, uh, as a 20 years longer business attorney in complex business litigation as well as contractual drafting specifically had the opportunity to examine that language which did state that he was not relying on an investigation into the guitar's authenticity. That language doesn't in any way suggest the representation that this is John Lennon's guitar is untrue. That would be a red flag. Well, the this is just boilerplate language in a contract. Uh, for the reasons my colleague articulated, we do not believe this is as the contract well, wasn't it's generic language that's not specific to any facts being represented the language was we think negotiated again he had the opportunity to review it on three separate occasions but i would guide this court again to the orca assets decision where the very standard that uh, respectfully your honor i think that you're trying to uh, uh, establish a standard for a direct contradiction which was flatly rejected by this court in orca assets in that the oral representation need to speak with specificity to the uh, same subject matter as the written language. And here, even if that were the standard, we think that the language respecting an investigation, which is the material issue in this dispute, whether the investigation, the results of that investigation, uh, here that namely that the guitar belonged or did not belong to John Lennon, uh, that is uh, sufficient to reach a standard if this court were to adopt and overturn over assets on this point, uh, that does reach a standard of specificity as to the same subject matter. And all we're saying, Your did, Honor, did is... Did either of the lower courts rely upon this red flag in, in uh, granting and then affirming the summary judgment? No, Your Honor, they did not, and uh, that's... So this is what you think is the most important red flag? Uh, yes, Your Honor, and as this court knows, of course, it is not bound by the lower court's decision. And in fact, we do disagree with some of the other red flags that the lower court, although they found in favor of... Uh, the respondents here. We disagree with some of the other red flags that the lower court identified because we believe they are inconsistent with this court's precedents setting forth uh, specific categories of red flags, uh, which this court referenced both in the Mercedes-Benz case, which you referenced Justice Underwood, as well as in its seminal ORCA assets can, decision. Counsel, counsel, can I come at this from a, from, a, from a different angle? Can you give me an example of a situation where the seller could say anything untrue? about anything at all that does not create a direct conflict red flag with the with the reliance provision that you just described well your honor this case would be different if we did not have a sophisticated party and so um that is a significant issue here uh, and if i could illustrate and i think to answer the court's question if there were a misrepresentation uh between two laypersons who did not have experience actual drafting and perhaps did not understand uh, the binding effect of a disclaimer of reliance clause, then I think the court would have no problem there discerning that that party may be justified in relying on that representation. But as this court has set forth time and again in evaluating claims of justifiable reliance, it must take into account the background, knowledge, experience, and sophistication of the parties. And you're saying this exact same factual setting, the exact same document, but instead of this guy having been a lawyer for years, um, he had just graduated from high school, hadn't gone to college yet, um, then we'd say, okay, you get, um, you get to invalidate this disclaimer, but because you're a lawyer, then you're not going to get to invalidate the disclaimer? We don't think that that's a bright line uh, test that this court should adopt, Your Honor. Um, however, we're saying it is significant that... and. And again, the question is whether or not that language at the time that the petitioner read, or in this case should have read, 
the agreement on three separate occasions was sufficient for a person of that background knowledge and experience to have discerned the red flag, which this court has called a very large red flag, that that language contradicted supported misrepresentation that he is alleging today. But this and brings up a point that I've been pondering somewhat since your introduction, which I certainly appreciate your quotation, but it raises the difference between should and must. Certainly in the context of an attorney's responsibility to their clients, that would be a must, that they follow that due diligence. But when it comes to their own dealings, even if they should take all these steps to be extra careful, that doesn't necessarily result to must. And so in Mr. Basemeyer's context, even though he does have experience as an attorney, even attorneys make mistakes. And so isn't this being rather harsh on him simply given his background? Two responses, Your Honor. First, um, this court has stated in Thigpen v. Rock in its decision in 1962 that a mere confidence and faith in the honesty and integrity of another party does not excuse a plaintiff in a common law claim for fraudulent inducement, the very cause of action before the court today, does not excuse a party from conducting, at the very least, a cursory investigation. Again, the, and, and point two he, he is he wasn't we heard talking about um, their relationship. He was talking about using Bates Meyer's background as a means of punishment. Your Honor, I think that would be a that would misconstrue our point that this is in any way punishing uh, Mr. Bates Meyer. We're simply saying that this court has before held less sophisticated parties to a higher standard than what the petitioners are arguing and what the question would suggest. Uh, and again, in Thigpen v. Locke, you had an unsophisticated party who had similar allegations of a close friendship in an attempt, and, and to clarify, I think the, the relationship uh, is important in determining what level of diligence the petitioner should have uh, 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 addressed, or ex excuse me, uh, taken on, but so is the sophistication of the parties. And in Thigpen v. Locke, this court said that even a party who did not have experience in contractual drafting was, despite a confidential relationship or mere allegations of a confidential relationship, not relieved of a duty to make a cursory investigation into uh, the, the purported misrepresentation. And here, the cursory investigation that we are asking uh, the court to hold Mr. Batesmeyer to is to simply read a two-page contract that he was presented with on three separate occasions, in which case he would have been made privy to the language that was directly contradictory to the representation that he claims induced him to enter the contract to begin with. It sure, it sure seems, seems like a whole lot of facts we're talking about. Isn't this, Isn't this better just to send it down and let a jury decide this instead of asking us to make this decision? It doesn't really seem like a matter of law kind of situation. Your Honor, the, um, this court has time and again decided the issue of justifiable reliance as a matter of law when there are facts less significant than these in the record sufficient to negate justifiable reliance. Um, and I would point the court to the Westergren case where even following a jury verdict, this court stepped in and decided uh, justifiable reliance as a matter of law on reviewing a, a judgment not of stante verdicto where you already had a jury determination. And that's because, um, well, two things. One, preservation of judicial resources when there are facts in the record where you have a sophisticated party in light of so many red flags here, uh, which I'd also like to address, then it does not, uh, it would not be prudent to use judicial resources to simply give parties alleging fraud uh, a free pass to a trial by jury when justifiable reliance is affirmatively negated by the facts in that there is this contradictory language in the contract and other circumstances. But should it uh, and be I'd the other way around, counsel? Sh shouldn't be they get a trial by jury? It seems more to me like they should get a trial by jury unless it's so obvious that then summary judgment is warranted. Here, we've obviously gotten to this point in proceedings. It doesn't seem so clear that summary judgment is so obvious to warrant. The red flags that this court has identified, Your Honor, with the summary judgment standard, and that is the standard we're asking the court to apply, that reasonable jurors could not disagree. One which I have discussed and this court uh, has asked about at length is a direct contradiction between the oral representation and the contractual provision. But 
others include, for instance, the party's own expression of doubt on the record. There you have a circumstance similar to a direct contradiction of A and not A. You have, on one hand, the petitioner stating, claiming that he was justified in relying on a representation, yet at the same time, at page nine of the record, that party expressed his doubt about that representation. He said, I'm not so sure about that representation. And that's consistent with what allowed this court to negate justifiable reliance as a matter of law, in fact, mandated that the court do so in both the J.P. Morgan Chase v. Orca Assets decision and in Barrow Shaver v. Carrizo, which the petitioners mentioned, which was decided as a matter of law. And contradiction, but it does seem there was a statement, right, about the lease being open, but then there were several indications that the land was not open. So why not have a narrow exception to the rule that ordinarily something goes to the jury that would decide certain things as a matter of law when you have something that actually goes to the merits of the representation as substantive? That's not fair, right? I see my time has expired. If I may briefly answer the question. The representation in Orca Assets that was, the contradiction that was recognized by this court in Orca Assets between the oral representation and the written contract is exactly what is present in this case. You had a mineral lease that was represented in writing that there were no warranties as to whether there was free and clear title to the mineral rights. And on the other hand, an oral representation saying, Orca Assets, go ahead and start drilling. It's free and clear. This court stated the party could not justifiably rely on that oral representation when there was this sweeping, even sweeping language. But again, it spoke with specificity to that same representation. That is the same direct contradiction. We ask this court to affirm the judgment of the court below and uphold the integrity of the oral expression. Your Honors, this court recognizes that fraud vitiates whatever it touches. Your Honor, you recognized that where there is fraud, you do not have a freedom to contract. Therefore, I ask this court to acknowledge that refusing to enforce a disclaimer of reliance such as the one in question today does not discount the freedom to contract. Rather, it upholds the Texas courts will not condone deceitful and fraudulent practices in a transaction such as this one. Individuals should not be permitted to hide behind a contract simply to cover up fraud. Batesmeyer should not be held to an agreement that he was fraudulently induced into simply because they wrote it down. Your Honor, you also recognize that at least three factors clearly or blatantly go against enforcement. Further, the counsel for the respondent argued that Batesmeyer's years as a lawyer weigh in favor of enforcement. However, as stated in Moss, Batesmeyer's professional status does not exclude him from protection under the law. Further, additionally, opposing counsel's argument regarding direct contradiction is outside the scope of this appeal. On page 24 of the record, Hughes would clearly assert that he is not arguing direct contradiction as a means of negating reliance. Rather, he is merely relying on red flags. Speaking of red flags, your opposing counsel said the record shows that your client had doubts about the veracity of the representations. Can you respond to that? Is the record clear that your client had doubts about the truth of the representations before signing the contract? Your Honor, based on the relationship of the parties, he was relying on the statements of his friend, and that is seen through their 55 years of relationship. I want to go back to the comment on direct contradiction. This court has held that the reviewing court cannot affirm summary judgment based on a matter not expressly presented to the trial court. Batesmeyer has a constitutional right to a jury trial. There is not enough evidence before the court today to deprive him of that fundamental right. As such, we ask this court to reverse the summary judgment and remand for trial. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. I think they deserve a round of applause.
and we will go deliver it.
Okay, so we were gone for a little bit because we had to have our own arguments, um, and and it was it was close. Um, and I say that totally honestly. It's obvious that everybody did a lot of work. Um, it's obvious that Sherlock professors did a really good job um, preparing you for what you needed to do, and we are very proud um, of all of you. But um, with a close vote, we ended up going with the petitioners. So Rebecca and Anna, congratulations. And we will let our new court president take over with the rest of the awards for this evening. Okay, so first again, congratulations to our winners. Um, and congratulations to our second place team. It was a big deal to make it this far, so congratulations to all of you. Um, and again, we want to say thank you to all of our judges that took time out of their day to do this for us. Um, so a big round of applause to them again. Um, and I also want to thank Professor Barry, who's not able to be here today. Um, a lot of the behind the scenes work is up to Professor Barry and he does an amazing job every competition, so I know he's watching at home, so a round of applause to him as well. <laughs> so, uh, without further ado, we will get into our oral advocacy awards. Um, actually, first, I messed that up already. We're gonna do our finalists and semi-finalist <laughs> plaques first. Um, so our semi-finalist teams, I'll read your names, and if you could come down and get your plaque from Walker. Um, your semi-finalists were Sean McLaughlin. Uh, Michael Stevenson. Nathan De Silva. Brody Vlope. I'm sorry if I mispronounced your name. Um, and then let's recognize our finalists. Um, our second place team, Nicholas Baker. And Jake Adams. And then the uh, winners of today's competition are Rebecca Miller and Anna Jennings. Okay, now without further ado, uh, we'll do the oral advocacy awards. Um, so the first few that I'll announce are not in any particular order. Uh, so we have Marco Pena. Sasha McLennan, you can come up. <laughs> uh, Alexandra Miner. <laughs> Macy McCann. Rebecca Miller. Olivia Womack. Jake Adams, and Sunila Tamiz. And now we will do um, our top three. Uh, we do have plaques for these three, and our um, second place, actually, there was a tie. So our top two, or I guess our second place speakers are um, Anna Jennings, Nicholas Baker. <laughs> and your top oral advocate is Sean McLaughlin. <laughs> um, 
Um, and after uh, we're done here, if you could all go in the hallway and we'll get some pictures. I know everyone loves pictures, but. Um, so I just want to thank you again to all of our judges and Professor Barry um, and Professor Underwood for making the announcements today before we got started. So um, congratulations again to everyone, and you all did an amazing job. And there are extra refreshments if anyone wants 